Yeah. You're right. Both of those books, Faster Wilds and Matrix, were written during the Trump presidency. Let's just hope it's the first and only uh, Trump presidency. When, I don't know about you, but every time I turned on NPR or opened the New York Times, it just felt waves of dread and angst and fear. And it was inescapable. It was like a shadow, a second shadow, just sort of following um, me around. I could not see the world that we were in. I was too full of dread, right? It was, it was just, it overhung everything. But I did want to write about the contemporary world. So I, I was caught within a paradox, right? So I was, um, I do think it's the the job of the contemporary artist to write about the world in which they're living, right? To to define the parameters or push against the parameters of the contemporary world. Um, and I I have very real issues with writing into the future, um, and so my only option was uh, writing into the past, right? Um, uh, but wait, you have issues writing into the future? Oh yes. Why? Well, with, okay, with climate change, when you write into the future, there is the automatic assumption that humans will survive what's going on. And I find it uh, because the, there's a story being told, which implies the teller of the story, which implies a listener to the story being told, which um, implies survival, right? But I think that might be a false representation of what uh will be happening in the world unless we actually do if we get our act together right now um so it feels to me like a false catharsis um j just baked into writing into the the future i did do it with arcadia um but i only wrote a few years into the future um and it was a and like it there was a covid like disease happening in 2019 in this book that I wrote um, that was published in 2011. Um, I, so I do, I have issues writing into the future. I think that um, for me, it is a morally suspect thing. I think that it is, uh, I'm not, I, I wouldn't go so far as to say it's unethical or immoral, but I, I, it's not, it's not, it's not right. It doesn't sit right for me. But I do think that we can write about the contemporary world by writing about history or a historical period because things happen in cycles, right? I mean, history happens in loops and spirals. We are now in a very strange loop and spiral, but you can look at times in the past when we were humanity, at least Western civilization was in something like this, not exactly the same, but something similar. So, um, and I think that those compressing those periods of time, this sort of ellipsis where you can actually talk about past and present at the same time is a kind of a beautiful tool, right? Because it can alleviate some of the initial discomfort in the contemporary reader uh, when they are picking up a book, right? I think sometimes I have a hard time, even though I am acutely aware of climate change, I have a hard time picking up contemporary narratives, even nonfiction, fiction, whatever, about climate change, because I'm already so subject to profound dread and angst and fear about all of this that I just don't want to add more with other people's narratives. But you can do it by talking about the past because climate change isn't only what's happening now, it is what has happened through the course of human history. So you can talk about what's going on now through a lens of the past, uh, upon the past, and then back and forth, right? So time can sort of reverberate, it could be like a tuning fork, back and forth, um, singing. Uh, so I, I embrace full scale historical fiction, which I think about 10 years ago, I confidently said I would never be writing again, <laughs> but I did it anyway. Yeah, right. Never make, <laughs> never make like such like proclamations, you know, it's never safe. <laughs> yeah. So, and I want to say you wrote Vaster Wilds or at least started it before you began Matrix, right? Yeah. So these, yeah. the sequencing of mm -hmm. these two novels is interesting to me. And you were working on Vaster Wilds, and I think you have said that you kind of wanted to write a version of Robinson Crusoe, or your version of Robin, Robinson Crusoe. But then, I mean, not to get too woo-woo here, you had a kind of 
visionary moment that led you to write Matrix and publish it first. Mm -hmm. I have to ask, I know you've talked about this, but I have to ask you to describe what happened to you that led you to kind of veer off the Vaster Wilds path momentarily and then write Matrix. Yeah, and just for clarity, I was writing both of them at the same time. It's just that Vaster was sort of at a low simmer while I was writing Matrix in a white heat. But um, what happened was, I had this incredible fellowship at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Studies at Harvard, and it was just, a, it's a once in a lifetime chance to go and sit among brilliant people in vastly different um, uh, academic fields. There were sculptors, there were um, filmmakers, there were geologists, you know, uh, physicists, just really brilliant people deeply invested in their work. And every week there are two or three lectures. And so you would go as a fellow to your fellow fellows lectures. And my friend, um, Dr. Kitty Bookish, who works at Notre Dame, she is a, um, an expert in medieval nuns. And she loves these nuns so profoundly. She just radiates love for these humans that of course she doesn't know. She only knows through the texts that they wrote and whatever they left behind. So she gets up on stage and she's just like so profoundly eloquent about these people. And I'm sitting in the audience feeling just deeply moved by what she's saying. And I remember my studies at a uh, university. I, um, I was a dual French literature and English literature major. And in French literature, I took a couple of um, courses where I would translate medieval French or ancien français into English. And I remembered the Lay of Marie de France, who is the first published female poet in the French language. And nobody knows exactly who she was. But as I was sitting there listening to my friend, I also remembered Marie de France. And as it happens, these things sort of swirl together and sort of clash and clyde. And I was having almost, it was a secular vision. It wasn't a religious vision, but I had the book in its entirety given to me while I was listening to my friend Kitty give a, a speech. That has never happened before. I've only gotten two short stories dropped whole into my brain. And I feel very grateful that that happened at all. Um, but yeah, this is, this is the only time that a novel uh, took precedence. And as soon as that it was born in my consciousness, this, this novel, uh, I realized that Matrix and The Vaster Wilds and then a third book that I pictured as I was sitting there as well, less completely, uh, they were a part of a trilogy, not a trilogy, a triptych. A trilogy implies a continuation of character or story arc or um, even theme or, I mean, I have thematic elements that are, are similar in all three, but they're all sort of singing to one another in vastly different uh, periods in time. So, of course, Matrix is the first chronologically, second, 1609, Jamestown is, uh, is the Vassar Wilds, and then the third one is more con contemporary. Um, and this one is the one that's actually actively driving me to my deathbed. <laughs> it's actually right now, it is so hard to write. I think I've written um, at this point, nine complete separate drafts of this thing, throwing them out in between, trying a new form, um, a new architecture and being unable to really nail what I'm doing. So maybe it'll be just a, a diptych and not a triptych, but we'll, we'll see. Wow. So when you get this secular vision of Matrix, when you're at Radcliffe, it comes to you whole. You can see basically the entire plot arc. You know how it ends. I mean, how whole is whole? And then what did you do after this speech by your friend Katie? Like, did you like run out of there and start writing? <laughs> like, what did you, <laughs> did you type it into your phone? Do you know what I'm saying? Or was it yeah. just all kind of, was it all kind of here? So it wasn't whole whole because I had to do a great deal of research in order to get to the point where I could write the book. But I, I saw this character. I saw who she was. I saw... Um, uh, the what the Abbey was going to go through. I saw the, the arc of the life and the structure of the life. And just the, uh, the day before I was on a plane and I was uh, watching this incredible 1949 film by George Cukor called uh, The Women, which is so ahead of its time and exactly of its time in brilliant ways. But it's, it's, a, it's a film that's unbelievably great writing. I mean, the writer Anita Luce, um, who wrote Gentlemen Prefer Blondes, um, the, the novel, 
was also a writer on this film, so it's so good. Uh, and the whole idea of this this film is that the only characters in it are women. But because it's from 1949, the only thing that these women talk about is men. Right? So like, it doesn't pass the Bechdel test, even though the only characters in this film are women, which is so devastating, right? Um, so uh, so I'm, I'm sitting here on a plane watching and I'm like, oh my God, they're, they're so, uh, it almost is a perfect movie, right? It's not quite perfect. And then the next day I had this revelation and I realized I was sitting there that there were going to be no men at all in my book. And um, uh, we would just sort of write a skirt around the, the, this world of women, this utopia of women and like almost, um, right men as shadows along the wall. They're present, but they're just not individuated, uh, just like women have been for centuries and centuries of literature. Well, I think one of the things that Vaster Wilds is, is definitely concerned with, I mean, your protagonist voices this on the page, but I think this would apply uh, to Matrix as well, has to do like thematically and even spiritually with this idea that human beings and so much of the trouble that we are in now and so much of the trouble that we have been in throughout our history on this planet, uh, at least our modern history on this planet, has to do with this misperception of Genesis with the ways in which patriarchy and um, this kind of misunderstanding of scripture or of higher philosophical takes <laughs> on how we should be operating on this planet have kind of led us into this kind of fallen state of confusion. Did I say that it's with any beautiful. degree of accuracy? It's yes. this idea. Yeah, this idea of this idea of dominion over the earth and all of its flora and fauna versus domination. You know, we live in a, I think uh, it can be called a dominator society and it's mm -hmm. not working out great mm -hmm. for most mm -hmm. of us. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, even the billionaires will die from climate change unless we change. So it's, it's not gonna work out for anyone, um, even if they hoard everything. Uh, so yeah, no, that's exactly what I've been thinking through in at least these two books. Um, this idea that, you know, in Genesis, when God gives Adam and Eve dominion over the, the fish of the water and the birds of the, the sky, um, dominion's been misread, right? It's been misinterpreted as uh, crushing, right? As, as sort of uh, not, um, it's a, it, like strip mining. It's been dumping nuclear um, water into the ocean, right? It's it's not um, caring for, it's not um, thinking through, it's not loving, right? It's it's the opposite of loving. So I do, that is something that joins these two books profoundly and the third one as well. Um, I do trace a lot of the ills of the um, Anthropocene uh, to religion and the dominant religion of Europe and the North America. Uh, yes, yeah, that's one of the projects of this book is sort of leapfrogging, almost skipping those, I, like a stone through time and seeing the dominant religion through the eyes of these women that are at the center of my books. And like having, having written these two books and kind of explored this terrain, like, obviously, this is just kind of a qu question. Uh, uh, I don't know. This feels like something that I found myself wondering as I was reading, and I was kind of musing. Like, obviously, we need more parity between the genders, and I feel like uh, there needs to be a more equitable world in, in a variety of ways. The question that I wonder about is, like, how much better would it be if like just women ran the show, because I think I've brought this up on this show before and I actually kind of got slapped down. <laughs> like my guest, if I'm remembering this right, was like, that's simplifying things too much. Women are complicated beings too and have, you know, they're human. So a lot of the things that plague us now as humans would plague us even if the shoe were on the other foot. But for somebody who's spent this much time 
meditating on this stuff and has done as much historical research as you have done. I'm just curious what your take is on it. I mean, that's at the heart of Matrix, right? I mean, I think that Marie's, um, she is female. Um, she's a nun uh, in a world in the book that is solely female. And yet she, and she's a rebellious person, right? She rebels against the, the hierarchies and the structures of the church and the patriarchy all around her. And in fact, she rebels so much that she creates like this, this physical earthworks to keep everyone out. But I do think um, e e we are human. We do internalize a lot of the same lessons from life. And um, sometimes I think power manifests its, um, the, the fact that it goes bad, it goes sour in people when the people suddenly in power start uh, imposing upon the people around them the things that they are themselves resisting. So Marie, though for most of her life she resists the patriarchy of the church, she starts imposing a higher, like a very profound hierarchy upon her, her nuns all around her too, um, even though she would not have recognized that herself. So whoever your mystery uh, guest was who slapped you down, I'm not slapping you down, but I am saying that, uh, yes, I, I think that a lot of the same problems would exist if women were in power. Um, just look at, I mean, I like Angela Merkel a lot. I mean, she, but, you know, Germany is not as radically great as it could be. Um, I don't, I do have to say, though, I think some things would be different. Right, I think, and maybe it is um, gender as um, artificially imposed social norms, but in the way that the world is set up now, um, since women are not the ones who are start who are the serial killers, right? it's, women very rarely are the murderers of the world um, or the the rapists of the world. It is possible that it just I don't know what that would be. Maybe it's it's social. Maybe it's probably not um, biological. But maybe things would be less bad. Um, they'd still be you know subject to immense appetite and greed and um, sorrow the way that we are now, but maybe it wouldn't be quite as bad. I don't know, though. We'll never yeah. have the chance to f prove this. So unfortunately, at least not in our lifetimes, at least not in our lifetimes. But I, uh, I've, I've said, you know, in the past, if nothing else, like we've seen the results of letting men run the show. Wait, we've got the evidence there. So it's like at least worth a shot. <laughs> to right? Try something I else like well, Mexico. Yeah. I mean, let's give it a this? Mexico is yeah, about to elect its first woman. And she may be a bad woman, yeah. but she, she may be the good one. <laughs> At least it's a woman. <laughs> well, but it's like uh, this woman and this woman that they elected in Italy, who oh, was not so not so great, right? Like no. considered, but like has it gone? But has it gone as bad as it went here when we elected Trump? I feel like maybe it's like a little bit less toxic. Yeah. So even the the point is that even like even the tyrannical bad women are maybe less are likely to be less tyrannical and bad than the male version of that, you know, makeup. Maybe. I don't know. Who but, knows? The only uh, way to try. Who knows? Let's try. Let's try. That, okay. <laughs> that's right. So another question that occurred to me as I was reading your novel has to do with, like, and I, I, this is something that I'm fascinated with in general, and I've asked of many of my guests, but you seem uh, to be a particularly good person to ask because it seems like a real concern of your work is to just talk about like where you are spiritually. <laughs> Cause I feel like you're wrestling with that stuff in your fiction. And I know from poking around a little bit that you grew up in a Christian tradition, but then moved away from that uh, in your adolescence and have sort of stayed away, I think, mm -hmm. but you're still grappling with it. And I relate to this. I was raised Catholic and never really took, but of course it never really fully leaves you either because you're mm -hmm. sort of born into this stuff and indoctrinated and so on. So I'm just curious to know like how you conceive of that stuff now uh, at this point in your life and in the wake of having written all of your books, but in particular Matrix and Vaster Wilds. 
Yeah, I was. I was a deeply fervent, deeply religious kid. Not because my parents forced it on me, but because I wanted to find an outlet, I think, for that that urgency in me as a child. So uh, I was the child who had a Bible on her nightstand and read every single night. Because also, let's be honest, there are really incredible stories in the Bible. Right? It's, a, it's a treasure trove of strangeness. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed that a lot. Um, but that fervency went away in as adolescence, as you said, because I, I started to chafe. I started to think that um, religion felt so small. Right? It felt so, it felt like an under imagination, uh, under imagining of the vastness of God, whatever God means, like the eternal mysteries, right? The, the, the swirling um, infinite beyond uh, human comprehension. And the idea of minimizing the, an impossibly large thing into language and story felt, started to feel wrong. So I turned my fervency toward uh, literature, right? I, I started to, to read poetry to sort of feel the same um, the feelings of radical attention, right? And, and radical um, care um, that I had felt in religion and then to, to fiction as well, of course. And I stayed there for a long time. And then another change happened when my, my boys were born, my little children, and there's something, I don't know, I, one does not have to, of course, have children or have had made children within their own bodies in order to, to feel this. But that, this is what occasioned it for me. I had this shift toward a, um, a yearning again for much larger feelings of spirituality, right? It's not that literature can't give you that, but that literature's um, attention to um, this sort of vast feeling comes only sporadically, right? if you're lucky a few times a year. Um, but I wanted that, that ecstasy that I had felt as a child almost every day. I wanted that more, right? I wanted that in my, in my daily life. Um, so I started thinking and I started writing and I started searching and I started going to different churches. The, the one that came the closest for me was a Quaker meeting that I would attend um, up in Boston. And the, the thing I love so much about it is that there really is no hierarchy, right? There's no one standing on a box yelling at you, right? There's no one... Um, it's just the whole community together, turning, a, turning the people in the community, breathing together in silence into a hive of bees in some way, right? All alone, but directed toward a, a silence, common something. And that's so, something, yeah. May, may I interrupt? Like, because yeah. I've never been to a Quaker meeting. When you go to a Quaker meeting, there's no priest or hierarchy, as you say. Mm -hmm. And then you sit there together in silence. Is that what a meeting yes. is? Yes, until someone feels the need to stand up and say something that has been pushing at them for a while. And when they do stand up, it is so moving and eloquent, right? Often it's one or two times in a meeting, sometimes it's a few more, but they're short little speeches, maybe five minutes long. Sometimes they're longer, sometimes they're shorter, um, where, where people really try um, very hard to articulate uh, profound feeling. Um, and, and that is, it's anti-hierarchical in a way that I really loved and I really responded to, right? And uh, the, the other, the people, other people in the, the Quaker meeting, they were, you know, Buddhists, um, atheists, they were uh, Jewish, they're, you know, Catholics. Uh, it's non-denominational, which I love because I do feel like, you know, God is so, the idea of God or whatever we're calling, you know, calling by the name of God is unimaginably vast. Um, and religion 
um, for me, this is just personal, feels, um, feels wrong because it's like it's trying to cage these vast feelings in words, right? And, and um, religion is an interpretation of God, that one that I don't have yet um, found adequately represents my own interpretation of God, right? Um, so, so I love this idea that all of these other people with different disciplines and different beliefs are together, just breathing together. There's no singing, you know, it's just, it's, it's communal and it's very beautiful, but it's still not quite what I'm longing for. And uh, the closest I've come to, to the things that I've been yearning for are those moments of beauty when something slips from the real world and you're writing and you write into that beauty, right? Like that happens once in a while or being in nature. And often just spending three hours on a hike, some sometime after two and a half hours, um, I, I will feel it. You know, I'll feel whatever that, that mysterious movement is. Those are the, the places I've been finding it recently. So what's interesting about what you said earlier is how as a child you gravitated toward this stuff without too much prodding from your mm -hmm. folks. Like this is something that you found on your own? Yeah. I mean, we went to church every week. My dad was a deacon in the Presbyterian church. I mean, this like, but church was, to, I mean, church was to me like a um, really tight, woolen stockings that slowly slid down my legs so that the crotch was at the knees, right? Like church was like really hard pews that I had to sit and stand and sit. And a, a chorus that did their very best. <laughs> um, and you know, like cold. And um, I think we lived for the cookies at the end, right? I mean, like church was not the same thing as, as God, which is for me, I found that in my like late night readings in the Bible, um, as a seven, eight, nine year old. Yeah. What was your favorite, like any, any like greatest hits in the Bible? Like you have favorite books or chapters or passages? I think the whole of the old Testament is so amazingly strange, right? It's, it's incredible. You can smell the desert sun sort of rolling off of the pages and all of the baguettes for some reason baguette as a word just makes me laugh <laughs> what, what wait what is a baguette i got a <laughs> you don't know what baguette is so like um uh, it's it's like a man has a child so he sires upon a woman a child so he begets a child he, um oh oh he, right okay you know, i was like, thinking yeah i was I'm thinking trying to like think of names. a bread loaf it's not a bread loaf but it's a verb <laughs> right <laughs> yes it's a verb it's okay. not a bed loaf okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of nature uh it's a good place to really get into faster wilds i mean it's right there in the title this is a novel that among other things i read this in a review when i was it was like a, i thought a great insight into your book is that it's an imagining of the implications of the settlement of the so-called new world and all that that entailed upon people who are often lost to history, the women, the children, the disabled, the domestic workers, you know, history is, what do they say? History is written by the winners or whatever. And usually the versions of history that we get that cover this stuff, cover the men in power with their like powdered wigs or whatever. And like mm -hmm. this book is entirely about somebody who is so sort of, you know, irrelevant to such people that she barely even has a name. I mean, her name is Lamentations. Uh, Z like she's given the name Zed, which is also the name of her uh, master's like pet monkey. And I mean, you know, she's, she's almost like a, a ghost person. Mm -hmm. And yet she is the hero or the heroine of your novel. Was that something that was conscious to you as you set about to write it? Like this is like kind of a corrective to history or like what history has left out? An imagining of that? Something like that. Yeah, I mean, I think that's something that fiction can do. There's this incredible cultural um, historian or um, na named um, oh, Sadia Hartman, 
Uh, she's at Columbia, I believe. Um, but she she has this thing called critical fabulation, where she is really deeply beautifully engaged with the archive. Um, but of course, the archive, as you said, was written by the victors, right? It's written by people who have a very specific idea of what is important enough to, to put into the archives. So she creates um, out of, she has a name, for instance, of an enslaved young woman in, say, New Orleans in the, the 18th century. And even though the rest of the details of this young woman's life are lost to history because nobody thought she was important enough to write about. Um, she still builds a life for these people out of a, a very deep understanding of all of the, the cultural warp and weave and tissue that's happening around these people. So it's this beautiful way of using uh, projection um, out of reality to create um, a space for people who've been forgotten. I think that's something that, that history can do. You know, I was, I have always been interested in the frontier narrative. I, um, I'm i from Cooperstown, New York. James Fenmark Cooper is our first frontier great novelist in America. Uh, and, you know, I could, like, two blocks away, I could sit on his knee um, in statue form, right? I mean, like, I, he, I, he, he's my kin in some ways. I loved those books as a kid, even though Mark Twain is right. I mean, he, his characters are wooden and his English is um, a little diminished. Um, it's still frontier. Uh, so I've always been interested in the frontier narrative, and yet I've always been um, angry about the frontier narrative because it's so exclusively masculine in, in all of our thinking. Right? You think of a front, uh, Western, it, what do you think of but like the laconic cowboy who's emotionally constipated and like murders Native Americans for, for lands, right? I mean, this is, this is what we think of. So it's, uh, that is a really... Um, backward looking kind of form. The mere act of putting a woman at the center of a frontier narrative seemed to me um, a way of, of changing it uh, in some ways. I mean, other people have done it, of course, but um, just bringing this, this servant girl, illiterate, uh, foundling, she, um, of course she has no money. She had no right to say that she didn't want to come to the new world. Nobody thought to ask her and she didn't think to wonder whether or not she wanted to come either, right? Because she had internalized this understanding that she was not worth very much. Um, so, so here she is and she's set free and um, she is in the beginning of the book really caged in a lot of the um, the received ideas about her culture, her people, herself, uh, that have just been handed to her, pressed upon her almost un with un unbearable weight. And as she's running through the woods, she's able to cast some of these off. They sort of fall off of her, or she inverts them within her with this um, extreme uh, survivalist um, run through the woods. Yeah. I mean, and this is another part of this novel that I quite love. Like, I love being outside. It occurred to me as I was reading it, I was like, I'm really not outside all that much in my reading of contemporary fiction, you know? And this book yeah. is this book is in the mud. I mean, she's eating, <laughs> like, bugs. And, I mean, you know, it's just there. And uh, I admire it, too, at the level of plotting because there is this run through the woods that runs all the way through the entire narrative. Like we're following her, wondering if she's going to get to safety or to wherever she she wants. She's headed north. She wants to go, I think, to Canada, where the French people are. Right? I mean, it's like yeah, this she, is her. She knows vaguely that there are French people in the north. She doesn't know how big the New World is, right? Like, because she's illiterate and nobody taught taught her, or nobody knows even, right? This is just all kind of up in the air. She's running yeah. toward the French. Okay. Well, it's like, it's funny, it, like taking into consideration what we talked about at the outset about, you know, the Trump years and not being able to grapple with contemporary life. It does make some sense to me that your heroine would be running for Canada. <laughs> right. Did that occur to you? Oh, 
during the pandemic, I had so many apartments like um, tabbed uh, in Montreal. All I wanted to do was go to Montreal and just like live there for the rest of my life. I still right. do. Yeah. Right, right, right. You speak French? Oui. You do? Okay. <laughs> well, that helps. Uh, you, you're all set in case it ever happens. But um, So I also want to mention, I mean, I, I really love the best character. Uh, you know, I, I said that we don't often see nature like this, this hardcore, a depiction of nature in fiction. There's a lot of interiority and like, you know, a lot of stuff happens inside <laughs> in, in contemporary fiction. People need to get out of the house. But uh, you also have very sweetly drawn a disabled child into your novel. And I'm a parent of a disabled child. Mm -hmm. I can't think of a book where a disabled child has appeared in mm -hmm recent fiction that I've read, you know, in recent years. So I appreciated that. And mm -hmm. it's very like compassionately drawn. And she, she, in some ways she's, she's sort of the heart of the book or part of the heart of the book. So I appreciate she that. Of the book. She's the best character of the book, right? I mean, right. she is, she's the, the one who knows what is going on and the one who is able to resist it in a very sad way. But yeah. Yeah. I love the girl best. I love the yeah. girl best. I worry how did these yeah. how did these characters occur to you like do you have do you have like a, a recognition of it i mean i know this stuff sort of happens while you're sitting there at the page and it's very it can be mysterious but when you talk about your heroine zed or lamentations and you talk about like a best character like can you remember where this stuff came from mm. no well i mean i think um Zed came out of her circumstances. I knew that um, the the central character had to be a foundling, right? I knew that she she had to be powerless, as powerless as possible, um, because history is actually built out of people who have vanished into history without a ripple. Um, it's not built out of Napoleon standing on a hill, right? It's about, it's about the, the humans at the, the base of the mountain who brought the oxen for <laughs> the feast that night. So um, I knew that I knew her, she came out some, some of um, my rereading of Shakespeare in order to get the language of this book, the sort of the Elizabethan music to it, I had to go back to Elizabethan, um, the best Elizabethan I know, which is, of course, Shakespeare. And so uh, just over and over again in his plays, there's this character of almost a sprite. Um, Ariel, of course, is someone who comes up a lot. But there are these um, these quick hearted um, peripheral figures that that happen over and over again and so she came out of that um the girl best came out of a longing that my character started to have for someone to love right that she's basically the only person that that this my my protagonist loved um well not the only um just about she's she is the heart of the book so so i don't actually remember i mean the the problem with the way that i write is that i write in um really f like rough drafts over and over again and so ideas start as just a, a tickle at the back of one draft and bloom about four drafts later into a full-fledged idea uh pfft. But uh, yeah, no, I love those two characters. I wanted it to be a stripped down book. So everyone in it had to kind of matter really intensely. Yeah, well, and also stripped down plot in some ways because, and, and you know what, actually that's not the right way to characterize it. And I'm gonna push back against some of the reviews that I've read that are like, oh, it's nature and it's the, you know, she just keeps running. And I'm like, yeah, she's outside. She's living in nature. like. <laughs> I, you know, again, my listeners who have been listening for years will make fun of me because I've brought this up perhaps more than anything else because it's the only cool thing I've ever done. <laughs> but I hiked uh, a good chunk of the Appalachian Trail after college. I have well, lived outside. I know what yeah. that's like to yeah. be, it's, there is a monotony to it. Mm -hmm. There is, and I, I, of course, was getting care packages of like dehydrated fruit sent to me by my mom. So <laughs> not quite as hardcore as Zed, but you know, food, when you're like burning that many calories every day, it becomes 
more primal than it would be otherwise mm -hmm. if you're like in your kitchen or at like Denny's or something. So I was riveted by it mm -hmm. and had no issue with it. And that is what you are writing. You're writing a story in nature. And I think maybe in our modern world, we're so like acclimated to constant stimulation that mm -hmm. the notion that we would, that, that a person would live like this is just like, you know, it's unthinkable, but uh, I loved it and I found it inherently dramatic, just this day-to-day -day survival. So a couple of questions and they're sort of related. You mentioned a minute ago, going back to Shakespeare to sort of get into the music of this language and to get into Elizabethan prose. And people listening who have not had a chance to read should know that there is something antiquated about the delivery. The voice on the page in this book feels from another time mm -hmm. and feels to me anyway, accurate. I'm far from an expert on this stuff. So I bought it though. And it's like just okay. really beautifully rendered. Other things I thought of, and maybe this is just me projecting onto your work, but I certainly thought of Cormac McCarthy. And I even thought of Hemingway. I thought like there's a muscularity and like a, just a real, like mythic music and a command that I guess I feel in their work that, you know, it feels like someone's like speaking from like outside of time or something, you know, I don't know. It's hard for me to characterize it. But in addition to reading Shakespeare and getting that music and that syntax down, was there anything else that you did? Were you reading, uh, you know, historical narratives or nonfiction to sort of, you must have to get the plot details down. Mm -hmm. And then just to complicate this question even further, like a second part that I would add to it has to do with the nature details mm -hmm. and the survival details as they pertain to early 17th century America or wasn't even known as America then. But you know what I'm saying? Like to get those details right had to have involved some deep reading too or was it just purely you're imagining have you did you yeah. do some field work did you do some field research like get outside with a a knife and a pewter cup and just try to figure <laughs> it out <laughs> i did not no oh, good but i feel like i could at least survive for two or three days in the woods if i had a knife so that's pretty good um no so okay so I'm so happy you mentioned Cormac McCarthy, whom I absolutely adored. I think he's extraordinary. I unfortunately read The Road when I was about to have my first son. And so oh, God. Like, that, that didn't poison my life per se, but it definitely made it much darker. Um, and there are certain parts of this book that are small homages back to The Road, uh, even though it's a vastly different book. Um, and of course, you know, when I was a kid, I, I probably read My Side of the Mountain 500 times, right? I loved Hatchet by Gary Paulson, right? I love Naked and Afraid. Um, I love, um, I love survivalist texts, even though a lot of them are, uh, like so radical right wing, um, texts these days. Uh, but I really like to collect them. I have a whole shelf in my library uh, based on like what to do if, you know, you have to camp out in, uh, the forest for as long as you need to. Um, so the, these are things I'm just obsessed with this. I, 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 I think about it a lot. I like, I read about it a lot. Um, yeah, I, I did a lot of, you know, reading all over the board. I read primary sources from the founding of Jamestown and then scholars, um, critical, um, papers and books sort of putting things into context. Uh, yeah, I, I read about um, what the forest would have looked like um, by the time the colonizers came. Um, and they weren't just wild, of course. I mean, the Native Americans had been caring for them and gardening them basically for uh, uh, tens of thousands of years. Um, but, you know, th these were all questions that I had to figure out and, and smooth into a narrative eventually over time. But it was, you know, I would love to spend my life just in the archives. I love it. I love it. I love it so much. 
But at a certain point, you think, if I spend any more time researching this, I will never write the book that I need to write. And so you just have to write it and figure out what the gaps in your knowledge are and try to fill them and then make mistakes and then, you know, do your best. Yeah. yeah did it ever in... Did it ever like bleed over into your day to day life? Are you suddenly talking to your children in like Elizabethan English? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do have to say, okay, this is the fun part about this. Because I write really fast, rough drafts in the very beginning, in the first four or five drafts, um, one of the drafts I just decided to write in IAMs. So it was all iambic, the entire thing. It was so much fun. I've never had so much fun writing a draft of a book in my entire life. It was a disaster. None of it worked. Right? <laughs> but the th the thing about imposing formal rules on um, fiction, in particular, is that it it releases really strange ideas that you had no idea were lingering underneath the text, right? Um, I uh, I started writing as a poet, and I really love formal poetry too. And so, taking architecture, some sort of um, superstructure and putting the book that I thought I was writing into that superstructure really changed the book radically in a really, really, really fun way. So, um, no, there was a time when I probably was speaking in IMs, but luckily my kids are not um, Shakespeare scholars, so they don't, they don't know. They don't realize. They don't <laughs> well, it's a good, uh, like in, in the interest of time, it's a good moment to kind of shift and you sort of just started us off to talk a little bit about how you work because I do think it's interesting, uh, this idea of writing drafts. I think you you draft in your at least early drafts by hand, or you did. Mm -hmm. You still do that? Oh, all of them up until the very end, yeah. You write in a notebook. Yeah, yeah. And you're writing quickly. How quickly is quickly? Like how quickly do you get an early, like first draft of this novel done? So this particular, it all depends on the book, but I knew that the, I wanted this book to be not short, but economical. Um, so this one I gave myself, I think one month for the first draft and it's a real draft, right? I mean, people's names change, what happens doesn't make sense. It's really just throwing out as many ideas as possible on the page and seeing which one is actually alive and then taking those living ideas um, and in the gap between the the previous draft and the next one uh it's really you start to see which of your ideas that you were really attached to um have a place and which do not have a place but you're just egotistically holding on to them and so it's it's you know forest fire coming through clearing out everything all the underbrush and then you've got the living big strong stuff for the next draft um and it happens over and over again and i really like this method because otherwise uh, I don't I don't love technology. I'm not a big fan. Uh, and I think writing for me, at least on the computer, does not allow me to make the mistakes that I want to make. Right. Um, it uh, it looks too much like the printed page. Um, I really need to make a lot of messes. And I if it's on the computer, I will reread it. If it's written by hand, I can't reread it because I can't read my own handwriting. Uh, so <laughs> Beautiful strategy. <laughs> yeah, you got to work with your weaknesses, right? Um, yeah, so I, I don't want to read the first few drafts. I do want to build the story in my head, kind of the way a painter would um, make studies of the, the larger painting that they're eventually going to do, you know, working on certain elements and um, trying to figure out the overall plan of the, the painting. So yeah, it's just a different way of working than a lot of people I know, but it doesn't make it any better or any worse. It's just, it's the way that I work. So, okay. So let me ask you, you write a draft in a month by hand, you fill a notebook or two, you then have to sort of parse through it somehow you are reading it right it's no, not like it's truly I can't read it. no i genuinely cannot read it okay so then you just remember whatever sticks mm -hmm. like like whatever's good sort of is still up here everything else falls mm -hmm. by the wayside yes and then you start over from scratch basically and just yes. redraft yeah and, which is and good. you do that you yeah. do that how many times you do that nine times i think you said you're on, yeah. on the book that you're working on now 
Right. Um, yeah, so Fates and Furies was 13 times. Uh, 13 was the, the time that I actually had enough that I could try to reread my handwriting and try to put it on the computer. Of course, what that does is it allows um, sort of the elements of uh, surprise to come in because I may have written a very pedestrian word, but my brain is trying to parse it and it comes up with something really strange and unusual and exciting instead that may be a better fit for the feeling of the scene that I'm working on, whatever. So yeah, um, it's over and over and over again. And for, I think, I think I do this in order to break my hunger for um, products, right? I mean, a book is a process, unfortunately, it's not a product. And I think if you think of it as a product, a finished thing, I think too early. I think that I um, won't take that that book to the place where it is best, right? I only get it so far. I don't get it any further than um, than I than my original ideas. But if, if it is a process, right? If it is writing and and putting to the side and starting over again, putting to the side then it becomes the act of writing is the thing that matters the most and not necessarily the finished product. When I do stop, it's become a, it's because it's come as close as possible to my platonic ideal. Um, and I can't take it any further and I need someone else to, to weigh in on it. That's when I stop writing handwritten drafts and try to put it on a computer. But beyond that, I think I would do it forever. Okay. Think, so, yeah. When you get to the end of your handwriting process, let's say you do eight drafts by hand, each one is its own beast. You're not actually rereading or using verbatim any of the drafts. They are complete, they're completely discarded. Mm -hmm. When you get to the point where you need somebody else to look at it, it is at that point that you go to your computer and type the thing. Mm -hmm. And you are not transcribing. You are then redrafting again from scratch, but this time typing it. I think I'm trying to transcribe, but since I can't write, read my own handwriting, I'm basically rewriting it based on a, like a vague memory of what I'd written there. <laughs> I mean, that's wild. Like you're almost like remember. I mean, you know, at that point, mm -hmm. you write. I mean, I do. I think when you spend a long time with a project, whether you're doing it this way or you're just mm -hmm. looking at the same Word document over and over again, you do develop an intimacy with it, especially if you're working on a regular daily schedule to the point where you can almost remember passages or, you know, you, you have that working knowledge. So I guess that would work then, you know, you have all these handwritten drafts, you get to the keyboard and you can render it mostly intact with some new flourishes and then you share it with an editor or your first readers. Yeah, I'm the kind of storyteller in real life that uh, the first few times I try to tell a story, it's horrific and really bad. <laughs> But eventually, as you tell it over and over again, it starts to, it becomes a remembered story in a, a completely different way. And you start to, to develop layers and um, different ideas and the story becomes much better the more often you tell it. So yes, uh, that's exactly right. It's, it's a remembered story by the time it, it ends up in the, in the final draft. Well, uh, reading up on you a little bit, there was something that I read where I guess a, the person who had written it, I think this was in the Atlantic, had sort of spoken to colleagues and friends of yours, and the word that kept coming up over and over again was driven. Um, I certainly get that sense from talking to you and knowing, a, you know, knowing how productive you've been over this past 15 years or whatever it is writing. Like you've published a lot of books. I also read that you get up at five uh, and write every day, mm -hmm. that you're a runner that you read 300 books a year and keep a log of it in a Excel spreadsheet. I mean, this, <laughs> this is like Herculean. That's intense. Is that true? It's my only job, right? My only job is to do these things. So I don't have, I mean, and I'm a mom, but like the kids are fine without me. They, benign neglect is good. Um, no, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I do have to say being driven is not necessarily a pleasant thing, right? I mean, there's always a demon chasing me with a whip. Um, I'm never at ease in the world or with myself. So yes, it's it's true. I get up at five and I read a lot of books, but um, 
I'm really tired a lot. <laughs> That's almost a book a day. <laughs> yeah, That's well, 25 I listen books a, a month. lot of audiobooks. And audiobooks count for me um, because you're, you're interacting with the book just in a different way. So, yeah, if I go on like a um, a two-hour run, uh, that's like four hours. A two-hour two hour run? <laughs> well, I mean, I'm You're not running for two hours? Runner. I'm a very slow runner, yes. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. yeah. No, very wow. slow. Right. Um, and I stop so, and I walk some too, so, yeah. All right, so I know we have to wrap up because you've got other stuff going on, but I think we talked about this in our last conversation, I think a decade ago or so. But I know that uh, your sister, I think at the time your sister was getting ready to go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, you know, like this is amazing. You've got an Olympic athlete in a family and like a really good novelist in a family. Uh, and then I think your brother is a doctor. Mm -hmm. Like you come from a family of like super high achievers, it seems like. Mm -hmm. And you have this drive and you say like you're not at peace and you do all this stuff with such discipline. Do you know where that comes from? Like, was this enforced upon you? Hmm. Is this self-derived? And the fact that it, or maybe it's just genetic. I mean, it's all your siblings are all, uh, you know, high achievers. Like, do you, have you thought about this? Yeah, I think we're people who feel things very, very deeply. And I think we sublimate really deeply in response, right? <laughs> I think that um, in order to cope with being alive, we all have to just, um, uh, do the things that feel the least um, destructive uh, in order to be to be humans on the planet. My sister is now she's 41. I'm so proud of her. She, I, it. This is this makes sense because this book is dedicated to her. But uh, she is 41. I was going to say. I was going to say. Yeah. She's in a PhD program. She has a toddler and she keeps winning Ironmans. Like she's going to Kona this year. She's freaking amazing. And she had been into Olympics, right? She just kept going. She's so strong. She's such an, an, an endurer. Um, and she's able to deal with pain more than any human I've ever met in my entire life. And, and sort of love pain in a way. Um, I am too wimpy to love it. Yeah, it's very cool. Well, but there is a pain involved in getting up at five in the morning and writing books. And no, that's that joy. I mean, I'm not. That's doing, joy, right? I'm not doing neurosurgery. I'm I'm getting up and drinking my coffee and like engaging with my imaginary friends. It's totally fun. There's nothing painful that's true. about it. Yeah. Well, it is a delight to talk with you, and I congratulate you on. Not only the success of the Vaster Wilds and its publication, but just all of the success you've had. Like you've been on quite a ride since we first spoke. I mean, you know, I think that was for Arcadia. I think that was the book that was coming out when we spoke last. And uh, I just commend you. And it's an inspiration to see somebody who is working at such a high level and producing all of these books. So kudos to you. And thank you so much for the time. Thanks, Brad. It was such a delight again to be on the, your show. <laughs>